Uh, we have a, a dear brother tonight, dear friend of the ministry. We've known Dr. Bob for, gosh, it's been like 20-something years. He's seen the church from its inception. He's seen our ups, our struggles, our victories, and he's always been there. He's a, he's a counselor, he's a friend, he's a teacher, and he's an over, over, all-over great guy. Amen? How many of you guys like Dr. Bob? Let's give him a big old round of applause. Dr. Bob, come on up and introduce your lovely wife to us. Thank you. Thanks, man. God bless you. Good to be with you. It's always good to see you, especially during these times of craziness. How many of you know it's kind of crazy right now? And it's always good to have my wife travel with me and uh, stand up so they can see you just for a moment. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Mm -hmm. All right. Everybody doing okay? You doing good? Okay. I'm going to talk to you about what do you do in times like these. Think that might be relevant? Okay. Okay. By the time we get through, you'll see how relevant it is. But I'm going to do a little introduction. Take your Bibles. We're going to go to 1 Timothy 2. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit, give you, just kind of give you some time to turn there. You know, probably the most consistent tool that the Lord has used throughout the years to bring people to faith is the bold preaching of the gospel. I think probably more people have been converted by that one particular means than all the other tools put together. But I'm fascinated by the different tools and the methods that Jesus uses to bring people to faith. First of all, he, he, he gives us a secret. This is what he says. He says, I only do what I see my father doing. I only speak what I hear my father saying. So the whole point is the Holy Spirit knows how to cause individual ministry to take place. How many of you realize Jesus knows exactly what button he needs to push in your life in order to bring you to the thought and the commitment that you need to have? Let me give you an example. Remember uh, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, very wealthy household, yet they were never required to sell their goods and give it to the poor. Yet the rich young ruler, what did Jesus say to him? Sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and, and come and follow me. He had to sell what he had. This isn't a double standard. He's looking for what controls and impacts the heart of an individual. Now, I'm going to pause there for a moment. How many of you realize in crazy times like what we're, really, what we're living in, what's really in the hearts of people comes to the surface? Jesus always is able to target with laser accuracy. To one person, he'll rebuke them. To another, he'd simply say, go and sin no more. So his method of bringing people into life is changed for each individual. Now, I'm, I'm trying to give you some real important stuff for you to remember in times like these. If you're a bit, a bit legalistic, if you like rules and regulations, if you like to say, well, you just say this prayer, you go to church regularly, read your Bible regularly, then you'll go to heaven. What I'm about to share with you is really going to give you a headache. Because that's not Jesus' style of ministry. Okay, now, now that, that's kind of setting you up. Now there's two references that I want to read and share with you before we go to our text. The first one is found in Luke chapter 5. Jesus in a boat, preaching to the crowd, turns to Peter and he says, cast your net on the other side. They hadn't caught any fish all night. Peter puts his net out and there's so many fish that the boat begins to sink. Now, pause there for a moment. Do you think that Peter hadn't already tried the other side of the boat? In the very next statement, Jesus says this, Peter, from now on, you're going to be catching men. How many of you know he's talking about evangelism? When Jesus prophesied this evangelistic anointing over the church, he used a net that was about to sink the boat as a standard. But Roberto, that's, that's what we're going to, Alfonso, that's what we're going to have to begin to anticipate. There's not a little trickle of a few individuals here and there. It's a massive conversion of people. I want you to know all the stuff that's going on right now is getting set up for this. All right. All right. 
So they put the net on the other side. Caught so many fish, boat's about to sink. I like this. Don't you like Peter? I mean, in some ways, I think your pastor's kind of like Peter. But anyway, Peter drops to his knees. <laughs> and he says, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. Now, not that part. But <laughs> and here's the fascinating thing. You know, Peter is repenting and confessing. Jesus has not preached any sermon at all. All he did was display a little power. You know, there's something interesting about the power of God. It automatically draws a line in the sand. I mean, you can do all the humanitarian things that you do, and we should feed the poor, help the homeless, all these things. No one ever gets offended by that. But when someone gets healed by a supernatural touch from God, people get all upset because the power of God draws a line in the sand, and it causes people to have to decide for or against. So Peter drops to his knees, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. A miracle brought him to repentance, a demonstration of power. Something so captured his heart because of this miracle that he left his entire lifestyle of fishing to follow Jesus. And just by the way, I want you to note, to, to note secondly that this story is also about a supernatural supply. Peter's a professional fisherman. And all of a sudden, it's a, it's a story about a miracle of provision. Y'all okay? So all I'm saying to you is that Jesus is targeting our hearts. He knows exactly what button needs to be pushed for you. Turn to the person next to you and say, he knows your buttons. <laughs> he knows your fears. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strengths. He knows your sources of pride. America. And to one he preaches, and to another he says nothing, and to a third he just demonstrates his power. Y'all okay? One of my favorite verses, all-time favorite verses, Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. Hosea 3, verse 5. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Hosea. 3, verse 5. <laughs> Listen to what it says. In the last day, they will fear God because of his goodness. Because of what? What happened to Peter? Jesus gave an abundant supply. He gave a supernatural supply. He showed some of his goodness and Peter drops to his knees. I'm going to suggest to you, Pastor, that we're on the edge of a time where we're going to see various displays of God's power Various displays of his goodness in ways that we have never seen before. And it's going to actually bring people to God. It doesn't drive them away, it brings them to God. So we have this story of supernatural provision, deep, profound repentance. This is the beginning of the journey of Peter to lay down his life of fishing to follow Jesus. Okay, second story I'm going to make some reference to is in Luke chapter 19. There's a crowd around Jesus. You'll know, you'll know this story, the very short man there in the edge of the crowd. He's pressing in because he can't see. He runs down the road, climbs a tree in anticipation. Jesus is going to come his way. And Zacchaeus, is, as he's climbing the tree, Jesus spots him, calls out to him, Zach, hurry, come down from there because I'm going to your house for lunch. Now, that may seem inconsequential to you, but I want you to hear what Jesus did was a profound act of honor. Because everybody wanted Jesus to come to their house. Would you like Jesus to come to your house? <laughs> Yet Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. I mean, these guys are crooked. They would swindle. They would steal. They would tax on behalf of the government and skim off the top. And they would accumulate a lot of wealth because of the people they abused and took advantage of. So they're despised by everybody. You get getting the picture? So when Jesus told the chief, told the chief among sinners that he's coming to his house, Jesus did for that man what everybody wanted Jesus to do for them. Now, this is really interesting to me. Just like Peter, demonstration of power, no sermon, brought him to Christ, to follow Christ. 
Here, there's no sermon that causes Zach to repent. I mean, Jesus didn't get in his face with his bony finger and tell him, you're a thief. You know, most of what you have has been stolen. Uh, he just said, I, I want to come to your house and share a meal. And the act of honor that he showed was a demonstration of the goodness of God. So overwhelmed Zach on the way to the house. Now, remember, Zach has not heard any sermons yet. I mean, they haven't even eaten yet. They're on the way to the house. Listen to his response. I'm going to sell half of everything that I have, or I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor, and if I've stolen anything or defrauded anybody, I will repay them four times of what I've taken from them. What's happening? He's repenting. He's making restitution. No sermon, only the goodness of God. The kindness of the Lord displayed through honor. I believe that this is an incredibly important part of the gospel story because one of the central themes of this season that we're in is a revelation of the goodness of God. You wouldn't know it by looking around. I guarantee you wouldn't know it by turning on your TV. So turn it off. Men and women, this is not goodness without difficulty. But it is goodness in the midst of difficult things. You and I have to learn how to anchor our thoughts, how to anchor our hearts on this cornerstone. And when we do that, it puts us in a place where we can actually hear Holy Spirit how to serve others. Why? Because Jesus doesn't serve anybody the same way twice. How to talk to a specific person. What that person needs. So instead of being cookie cutter type of Christians who have the same message and the same little tract for everybody, how many of you know sometimes he wants to move differently? Have you ever noticed the miracles in the Bible? Every miracle was done different than the previous one. There's never this duplication. Now, Pastor Alfonso mentioned principles. I think there's principles and we need to learn them. There's laying on of hands, confessions, declarations, various things. They're all very important. But I think the most important is learning to hear from God. We need to be a people addicted to his voice. We need to be voice activated. <laughs> we need to learn that in our personal lives, if we listen well to Holy Spirit and how he moves with us, then we will know how to serve other people. Because sometimes people need to be confronted and other times they just need to be loved. I remember years ago, a guy was visiting our church. It tells you years ago because I was pastoring. I was about 30 years ago. And I was at the front of the church praying for people. She came up to me and she said, Bob, I tried to commit suicide last week. Now, I'm normally a fairly compassionate guy. But I found coming out of my mouth the phrase saying to her, well, you need to repent. Most of that time, that kind of situation would require gentleness, comfort, love, encouragement. But in this case, that literally erupted out of me. You, you need then to repent. Later, she, told, she fell on the ground crying. And later, she told me, she said, you know, when you said those words, I literally saw a sword coming out of your mouth and pierced me. How many of you realize I wouldn't use that as a general rule of thumb of counseling people who want to commit suicide? It was the grace of God. It was the goodness of God for her at that moment. He knows we don't. Men and women, if you haven't gotten this figured out, we don't know how all of this election stuff's going to turn out. You may think you do, you don't. Nor do I. But I know one who does. I know this, he turns the hearts of kings wherever he wills. I know this, my God is still on the throne. All right. That's my introduction. I'm setting you up. Here's, here's, here's our text and our message. You ready? 1 Timothy 2, the first four verses. 1 Timothy 2, 
verses 1 through 4. First of all, then I urge that entreaties, prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving, what do you do in times of the craziness like what we're living in? I'm about to show you. I'm about to show you you have a mandate, you have an assignment from God, and if you'll do it, it will make a change. I urge you that entreaties, prayers, petitions, thanksgivings, and critically important word, thanksgiving, be made on behalf of all men. Say on behalf of all men. Behalf of all men. Not at men, on behalf of all men. Mm -hmm. For kings, all who are in authority, they know that we may lead a tranquil, quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All right, look back again at verse 1. He says, first of all, in the Greek, that's in the superlative, which means it's your top priority. He's saying, here's your top priority. Here is your assignment. I want you to focus on it. I want you to be ready to pray constantly, continuously for everybody. Pray for those in authority. Pray for your kings, your presidents, your leaders, all those around you. Keep this continue, continuous voice of prayer going. But then he adds the phrase, with thanksgiving. You might want to circle that. Thanksgiving changes the nature of prayer. How many of you know many times when we pray for our leaders, we pray at them rather than on their behalf? We pray our political views. We pray what we think God needs to do concerning their lives. Are y'all okay? Remember, the Lord has called the people of God to be priests, a royal priesthood. And as a priest, we represent people before God and God before the people. It's a unique role, even as a worshiper. But it's also as an intercessor. We pray for people. We pray on their behalf. But the moment we turn from praying on their behalf to directing what we think God needs to do, God then moves to defend our misuse of authority. I'm just letting you think on that for a moment. That's why many people that we thought God should have disciplined them actually got exalted because the very church that accused them, God himself had to protect them from that misuse of authority. Come on, guys, you got to get this. I'm trying to show you that when you pray at people versus on behalf of people, you actually cause God to have to come to their defense and he can't do what he needs to do with them because you're busy trying to direct traffic and you're not the cop. You know, it's no secret. The political spirit is running rampant throughout the country. The political spirit is cruel and divisive. It feeds on failures and division. It doesn't care what side of an issue that you're on, long as you stay angry. <laughs> angry about being right. Angry that everybody else is wrong. That's the polit political spirit. But I'm here to tell you tonight, you and me, as men and women of the kingdom of God, can dismantle that spirit. I'm working here, y'all okay? Regardless of who you vote for, the point is we've been given an assignment from the Lord to pray on behalf of. Come on, say it. I'm gonna show you how to do that in a minute. All leaders, people in authority with the giving of thanks. Giving of thanks. You know, it's hard to pray at people and to be thankful for them. Think about it. It challenges the attitude of prayer. It does not allow your prayer to be focused at them. Let me show you a little how it works. How many of you remember Nebuchadnezzar, one of the most wicked men that ever lived? He had killed people who wouldn't bow down and worship his idol. He had issues. He had a lifetime subscription to issues. <laughs> so here's Neb, and he finds Daniel, who is supporting him. But Daniel never supported the wickedness, never supported the sin, never did anything to protect the evil of Nebuchadnezzar. Yet he served Nebuchadnezzar so profoundly that towards the end of his life, his final words were praise to the Almighty God. 
I personally consider Nebuchadnezzar and the Gezerim demoniac the two greatest conversions in the Bible. How did it happen? It didn't happen because Daniel condoned sin. It happened because Daniel prayed on behalf of, he was loyal to his assignment. If you don't see your assignment to pray on behalf of those in authority, then you don't know who you are. Royal priesthood. Chosen nation. Prince and princesses of the Most High God. The only way you can take on a spirit of accusation, are you listening? Is for you to step outside this God-given assignment. I'm trying to help you guys. What do you do in times like these? You pray on behalf of, with thanksgiving for all those in authority. Why? What happens when you do that? We're going to see in just a moment. The only way that you can become an accusing person You cannot accuse, criticize, and pray on behalf of with thanksgiving at the same time. Boy, that's really good, Bob. I like, sheesh, man, that's good. Did you get that down, Pastor? That was good, yeah. I mean, I prayed for Bush. I prayed for Clinton. And then I prayed for another Bush. I prayed for Obama. Now I'm praying for Trump. I know that there are deep, profound issues involved that are going to affect all of history but here's the deal the Lord has revealed to us in this passage how a culture can be formed and developed how the values of a society can be shaped as you pray on behalf of I want you to digest this thought when you pray for an individual you actually, when you pray on behalf of an individual, you actually help to influence the atmosphere from which they draw their ideas. How many of you think that might be important? But when we fail to pray on behalf of our leaders, we leave them to draw from whatever atmosphere they're in, even the demonic. Because don't deceive yourself, the demonic wants to influence. A couple of hundred years ago, believers in a particular nation felt that their leader was the Antichrist. So the church in the nation took up a position and refused to pray for the man. The man, in the absence of prayer, in the absence of people praying on behalf of, in the absence of that prayer covering, became vulnerable to the things he would not have been vulnerable to if they had prayed for him. He actually, because of their lack of prayer, I believe, became the fulfillment of their prophecy. He became the Antichrist to them. He opposed, persecuted, led great opposition against the church. All that attitude... That animosity was developed in the absence of the prayer support from the body of Christ. How am I doing? If you were one of the believers during that time, you might have said, yeah, man, I'm not praying for him. He's the Antichrist. That's like praying for the devil. And of course, you will feel you're very discerning. <laughs> Especially when he becomes the very thing you said he was. See, I told you so. But if you could peel back the spiritual realm, you would see the cause and effect lands in your lap. We need your prayer influence. This responsibility to pray on behalf of these people. How many of you know these are people that have the same basic needs you and I have? These guys and gals that are locked up in the political system, you know, everybody wants something from them. I wonder if they really have any friends. Friends that don't want something. What do they need? Well, they need to belong. 
They need true friends that don't want anything from them. They need health. They need provision. They need to be loved. They have the same kinds of needs you and I have. So what do we pray for them? I'm about to tell you. You ready? How do you pray on behalf of someone? Regardless of their relationship with God, here's how we're going to pray. God, we desire to see the advancement of your purposes in this earth. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you say that with me? Can you make it a prophetic prayer? Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Look again at verse 2, that they may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. The intention is, if you pray for the leaders, the people around you, the people that you work with, as we pray on behalf of, we're actually setting the stage for healthy community life. Where the streets are safe, where there's peace in the streets, where there's joy and prosperity of community life. There's whole and healthy relationships. All these things are a result of praying on behalf of. You don't pray at them, you pray on behalf of. So on behalf of them, we are setting the stage for healthy, productive community life. Where we can live, businesses thrive. Not just because one big dog eats the little dog, but there's mutual benefit, personal fulfillment, relationships are strong, families are healthy, friendships are forever. This is the product of this type of praying. Then notice what he says. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Here we go. I'm going to bring this kind of full circle now. Who causes all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's how we started off talking about how preaching is probably the most prolific tool by which men and women have come to Christ but God does everything differently according to the needs of our heart. But I, I, I hope you're getting this. This process ends with a display of God's heart, and it's for all to be saved. It might be fair to say that this process can lead to the most significant revival of all time. I believe that's what's getting set up. I think the enemy means it for evil, but God's going to flip it on his head. God desires for you to have a quiet and peaceful life. You have a choice, though. You have to exercise your authority, the embracing, embracing of your personal responsibility, the receiving of your assignment. God has some very significant plans in this next season. More and more people are going to get saved. I don't mean that generically. You're going to see it. I believe there's going to be come on this church a boldness. We're going to move from the fishing pole to the nets. We're going to find boatloads of fishes. <laughs> people are going to drop to their knees, not because of our great sermons, but because of the goodness and the power of God. Supernatural provision. I believe they're going to be visitations. I'm speaking to you prophetically now. I believe they're going to be visitations on people's households that you would never expect God to visit. The Zacchaeuses. He picks up, he picks people we wouldn't pick. And he says, I'm going to their house today. I'm going to demonstrate myself strong. I'm going to show my goodness to them. And then he demonstrates his kindness and goodness, and it's going to bring masses of people to understand who he really is and lead them to a deep heart of repentance. Thank you for visiting our YouTube and our Facebook channel today. Subscribe to our YouTube or our Facebook channel so you don't miss any of our services. If you'd like to give an offering, you can do it through donate.ciforlando.org. And once again, thank you for being part of our mission of reaching, restoring, and building the families all around the world. God bless you.